Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to speak to you uh, about um, how we uh, have set our own trajectories at Société Générale and also how we implement them. So what are the actions that we are taking to, uh, to decarbonize uh, our activity? Uh, so, uh, just as a web introduction, uh, I'm a, a head of a, a team called Impact Based Finance, which sits in the investment banking division. So, Société Générale is a big group. We're over 110,000 people. So, you can imagine there are very different uh, areas. We have a retail network in France, uh, in uh, Czech Republic, in Romania, many retail networks in Africa. We also do uh, uh, um, equipment finance, we do uh, car leasing. Uh, and investment banking, of course, like in any other investment bank, which is maybe an area you're more familiar with. But I'm saying all this as a preliminary uh, remark because um, each activity, uh, as, as just been said by Deborah, has their own issues and you have to look at each of the activity of the bank and therefore at each of the activity of the clients of the bank because in uh, most cases we are just financing what uh, the companies we are lending to uh, are, uh, are doing. Uh, so, oh, it's the green one. I need to push. No? Yeah. Okay, so this one. Okay, good. Uh, so that's a quick reminder of, I mean, the bank had been in existence for over 150 years, uh, but um, recently we re-established our, uh, our, uh, our corporate purpose. Uh, in, in order to really uh, anchor uh, in uh, every um, activity that, uh, that we lead, uh, our objective, which is to, to build together with our clients who we are financing, uh, a better and sustainable future uh, through responsible and innovative financing solution. So how do we do that? Uh, so uh, there are four uh, key areas of action that we have and that uh, has uh, informed us to uh, uh, to create targets and uh, actions to, to actually implement them. Uh, first, we are increasing, and we've increased recently, I will go in more detail in, in a moment, uh, our environmental and social commitments, so setting ourselves uh, targets uh, and uh, working with our clients and with other stakeholders to, to actually have uh, targets that uh, make sense and that are in line with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals and with the, uh, the Paris Agreement. The, um, IAE uh, uh, net zero emission uh, uh, scenario. Uh, to do that, uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, obliged to uh, rethink uh, our activities. So, um, and I'm well pleased to know that because most of my careers have been financing oil and gas uh, fields. <laughs> and so, uh, of course, we cannot continue uh, to do this if we want to align with, uh, uh, with net zero scenarios. So we need to shift uh, certain activities of the bank in order to reduce uh, our exposure to certain sectors and increase uh, uh, our, uh, our activity in others. Uh, one thing we're also doing, especially in my team, is opening new markets. Uh, so natural capital, which Deborah just spoke about, is one of the key uh, markets that uh, we are investing uh, a lot on in order to accompany our clients uh, so that they can make uh, investments uh, into natural capital. Uh, so as to generate the carbon credits that will uh, allow them to comply with their uh, net zero commitments, for example. Uh, then, of course, at home, in our own uh, company, uh, we also want to lead by example in terms of, uh, uh, you know, our social uh, uh, practices, uh, diversity, uh, and also, uh, you know, empowering uh, uh, our, um, uh, our, uh, our employees and, and working with local communities in the areas where the bank is, uh, is present. And for our own building, so our scope, uh, uh, our scope one, uh, one and two, uh, we have taken the commitment to halve uh, our carbon credit, uh, our carbon footprint, sorry, uh, between 2019 and 2030. And then, uh, because, you know, it's good to look at uh, developed uh, countries, we always focus, I mean, a lot of the talks about energy transition is really focused on uh, Europe, uh, the US with the IRA and the, uh, uh, you know, and um, developed, uh, you know, OECD economies. But we, we need to remember that 85% of the world's population lives in emerging and developing economies. And today that's where more than half 
of the GDP growth occurs. So we need to be, if we want to have an impact, we need to, to, to do something about uh, allowing those uh, uh, different uh, countries to have a sustainable development, so to have access to electricity, water, uh, you know, uh, energy-free uh, buildings at, uh, at an affordable cost and, and, and taking into consideration uh, their, uh, their means. So that's why uh, we are uh, uh, doing a, a lot of things as well in emerging markets, and sometimes we cannot um, make those financing from our own balance sheets because of risk appetite reasons. So we partner, and I'll give some examples, uh, with uh, impact funds or uh, other uh, investors that have more uh, uh, risk appetite than us uh, to make those investments. So uh, here it's a summary. I won't go into uh, uh, too much detail, but uh, we have uh, long ago, uh, even before the, the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, uh, set ourselves an internal framework which we call positive impact finance. Uh, in order to assess some of our activities according to the positive impact we can identify and making sure the negative impacts are, um, uh, are, are monitored. And uh, very, uh, very uh, quickly, we decided to uh, uh, use that framework to, uh, uh, to, 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 to decide uh, on, uh, um, uh, on, on the, the, the trajectories we want to go on. And recently, of course, uh, since this topic has been, uh, has been more uh, uh, pregnant, uh, we, uh, we have uh, participated to a lot of working groups uh, within, with peers, uh, so with other banks, uh, to define the common scenarios, because we believe in a, a convergence uh, of the methodologies so that everybody can be compared under the same methodology and not everyone has, a, has their own methodology. So we were one of the founding members of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, uh, which is a collaboration uh, between uh, banks in order to agree uh, on the same methodology uh, to define uh, the targets to reduce, uh, to reduce our, uh, uh, our carbon emissions. And so, uh, in total, uh, we have, uh, as you can see here, I won't go into detail, but uh, we can say that uh, we are one of the leading banks in terms of the aggressiveness uh, of the ambition we've set ourselves. Uh, so, uh, uh, if we look in, uh, in more detail here on each of the scenarios that and we've just released this uh, book, which if you're interested, you can uh, consult. It's available uh, online, our uh, progress report on the uh, Net Zero Banking Alliance. So for each of the most emissive sectors, because of course you want to start with the sectors that uh, produce most emission, we have set ourselves some targets, which you can uh, see here, uh, starting from a baseline, which is the, the blue column uh, on, the, on the left. Uh, so baseline, uh, uh, which is most of the case uh, 2019, but uh, uh, in some cases uh, a bit later. And setting ourselves target not only for 2030, uh, which is, is quite far away, but sometimes also intermediary targets uh, in 2025, uh, so that we show some progress uh, uh, in, the next, in the next few years and not push for kick down the can. Uh, for, uh, you know, years 28 or, or 29 uh, to get our 2030 targets. And if you compare our targets with the, uh, with the um, IEA uh, net zero emission scenario, uh, which is, uh, I mean, one of the scenarios, but the most commonly agreed uh, uh, scenario uh, for uh, uh, net zero uh, 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 on, the two, on the 2050 horizon, you can see that in many cases we are more aggressive, so we, we set ourselves target where we're going to reduce more than uh, what is expected on a, on a global basis uh, at, the, at the level in order to meet this scenario. Um, so, what, uh, so how are we doing that? So yes, on the left, just showing that uh, it's good to have our own targets, etc. but what is more important is that they, they match uh, that of our clients, because what we do at the end of the day is finance our clients. So if our clients are not moving, they are now changing uh, their uh, real estate portfolio, uh, retrofitting uh, their LNG tankers, or uh, uh, you know uh, um, uh, insulating uh, their uh, you know giga uh, battery, uh, uh, giga factories of batteries, uh, we are not going to be able to meet our targets. So that's why we are participating, and sometimes we are at the, um, at, uh, at the origin of some uh, coalitions in the sectors where we are active uh, in order to incentivize our clients to, uh, to move on this topic. 
And uh, so that's the target. So now how do you deliver the targets? Uh, well, you remember we have 110,000 people, so we have to put them in motion. <laughs> and many of them, they absolutely know nothing about uh, you know, uh, CO2 emissions. I mean, not anymore because we've done a lot of training precisely. So there's a lot of work that has been done in the past years to train uh, the, you know, uh, the SG employees and basically so that they understand what's at stake. They understand the targets we have set for ourselves and they understand what it means in terms of how they must change their business. So for example, me, I was an oil and gas banker. Well, we're progressively getting rid of all the oil and gas teams. That doesn't mean that we get rid of the people because I'm still here and I'm working on, the, on impact financing. But it means that uh, you need to shift, and that's why we have this uh, transversal initiative that we call the shift. You need to shift uh, the energy uh, uh, deployed into a new market. So on that shift program, I won't go into details, but it's, it's really a major transformation program. And that's only for the global banking and advisory division, but similar programs are happening in other business units. So the equipment finance, for example, they have set a big uh, uh, ambitious uh, plan as well, where they're really focusing on circular economy uh, and monitoring uh, the, uh, the, 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 the choosing to originate uh, equipment finance from equipments that have positive impact rather than, um, uh, than not. And the way we've done it really is to create these communities or value chains, which are basically a way to make people work together um, uh, share experience, cross-fertilize uh, between, you know, good idea of a financing that was made in the, for example, a hydrogen value chain. Can it be used in the uh, mobility one uh, or uh, everything that is linked to, for example, sustainable and agriculture uh, sector, which is not an area where we are very strong, uh, pulling together all the experts of the bank to work together and see uh, what, uh, what can be done and how we can scale up uh, first financing made. Uh, another thing that we're doing, which is the part I'm taking care of, which is the new businesses, uh, is uh, since we're going to withdraw uh, from many type of financing, we need to uh, onboard new clients and onboard new sectors. So that's why we're developing this natural capital solution business. Uh, that's why, for example, um, uh, they, we are looking into uh, and starting to do first transactions into uh, financing decentralized solar projects uh, in Africa. So in Africa, for example, well, in the world globally, you have uh, 900 million people that are, uh, uh, sorry, 800 million people that do not have access to electricity. So it's about 10% of the population that do not have access to electricity. Uh, so what are we doing for them? Well, in most banks, nothing. <laughs> Why? Because it's small projects, uh, it's in difficult countries, it's dispersed, it's small developers, so, you know, nobody cares. We prefer to do a large, big, one billion projects, and it's easier, it's faster, and we get better fees. So the idea is to say, well, we need to find a solution, and it's a big market. You know, we're talking about a market of uh, 800 million people that have money to spend on uh, uh, electricity. So one of our part uh, of our, our activity is uh, through partnership and uh, by research, uh, we've put together some solutions uh, to finance portfolios uh, of uh, mini grids uh, for developers that have a track record. And we have partners like Warren Co to de-risk these portfolios uh, with a view, of course, uh, to uh, do it uh, by our own uh, later on. What we've done also is to partner with an impact fund called AfriGreen, which is a debt fund that has been set up specifically uh, to finance small-scale solar projects uh, in West and Central Africa. So uh, they have a small team with experience in that space, and by funding, by being an LP to this fund, so by putting our equity into this fund, we enable them to make those transactions we, call, we have the possibility to co-land with them, so we're going to learn how they're doing it, uh, and we're going to get our uh, credit committee uh, a bit more familiar with those risks <laughs> and, and certainly um, benefit from the agility uh, that they have being a small impact fund, uh, which you know, uh, can act and make decisions much faster than a big institution like Sustainable. And then the last one, which is important as well, the client sustainability journey. <laughs> Uh, we've done a lot uh, of work uh, to help our uh, senior bankers, our bankers, the relationship managers for all the clients in all the sectors, to understand 
what are the challenges of the sectors of their clients so that they are able to engage a dialogue with their clients and more importantly, so that they're uh, able to assess where their clients are on their trajectories. Because uh, with the trajectories we're setting for ourselves, uh, you know, there's only three possibilities. E either the client is indeed also aware and has done the work and is engaged in the same trajectory. And in this case, they're going to stay a client and we're going to fund them in order to achieve uh, their goals. Or they don't want to hear about that. They can't care less. They want to. <laughs> yeah, they want to exploit the last drop of oil. Uh, you know that, uh, and they will continue to uh, explore. And 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 that does not match our scenario. So uh, uh, at some point we're gonna have to, and very soon, in fact, we're gonna have to uh, uh, to stop the relationship. So we're gonna say, well, sorry, we cannot work with you guys. We told you this is how you are. This is where you should be. You are not taking this strategy. So. It doesn't match, we cannot keep you in our portfolio. And then, uh, uh, so that's what can happen. There's only two things that can happen, I would say, with an existing client. And then, of course, we want to onboard new clients uh, that are the uh, emerging leaders uh, of the new economy. There are so many new companies that uh, uh, are created with a purpose to solve one of the challenges. So it's not just carbon, it's also, uh, uh, you know, social impact, biodiversity, uh, uh, the protection of the ocean, uh, preservation of water, etc. So these guys, we want to onboard them as new clients and uh, fund them for their uh, for their development. So that's just uh, you know the approach that our team is 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 uh, is taking, which is to say, we want to uh, finance uh, companies or projects uh, where we can clearly identify a positive impact, where we have made sure that the negative impacts are, are properly assessed. And we have all this big toolbox of all the Société Générale expertise in project finance, in asset finance, in Africa, in Czech Republic. And depending on the situation, we will pick in one of those toolbox to, to make this, uh, this financing happen. Uh, and when we cannot do it because it doesn't fit our risk appetite, we will find an investor or an asset manager uh, that has uh, this appetite and will make sure uh, the, the transaction can be made. And to finish with, uh, this is also something to show uh, our commitment to these new businesses. These new businesses are going to cost capital because it's more risky. We've never done it. So the regulator is going to say, oh la la, it's uh, very risky. <laughs> you cannot put this in, in your normal uh, debt portfolio. So that's why we decided to dedicate an equity envelope uh, to support uh, the bank's uh, development of those new markets. So onboarding those new emerging leaders uh, in the energy transition, investing into a nature-based solution, and uh, uh, contributing, making those first loans, which are going to be more risky, uh, to those uh, impact-driven uh, projects, like the one I mentioned uh, for decentralized solar, but it could be also regenerative agriculture. For example, we're working on a, on a project in Ivory Coast uh, on agroforestry. Uh, where we need to help the farmers transition uh, from uh, deforesting in order to plant their cocoa and not have good practice, which at the end of the day ruins the soil and they have to deforest again uh, uh, to, to, to continue producing. So switching from this to adopting the right regenerative uh, agriculture practices so that they can stay uh, uh, in, their, in the same space. Through these practices, they can issue carbon credits because they will improve the, the sequestration of carbon in the soil and uh, provide the livelihood for their, their family and, 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 and of course sell, sell the crops at a better price because more and more um, large companies that are the buyers of this cocoa, uh, they want sustainable cocoa. They, they, want, they don't want to be accused in the press that the cocoa they buy they know for sure that it comes from deforestation because nobody can avoid, you have GPS everywhere, <laughs> you cannot not know <laughs> that uh, your suppliers, they are actually uh, uh, causing deforestation to, to supply your cocoa. So, I mean, that's about it in a nutshell. I know uh, it's already late, so uh, I will probably take the, yeah, the questions later, right? Oh, I stay there for the questions. <laughs> I put the questions where later on, but I come back. Yes. 
Um, hello, I'm Kongei yep. uh, from SF Business School. I have one question. When you say a net zero strategy, normally a corporation talk about a scope one, scope two. So in this case, like divesting from oil and gas industry, it means like um, we can reduce like us. Is this talking about scope one or scope three? Hello. I'm not the expert on this, but I looked at the slides before I present them. Because we have a whole team working on those trajectories. And you'll see that on oil and gas, it includes a scope free. Uh, so the end user. Because that's where most of the emissions are. And in oil and gas, it's the, it's the use of. Uh, of uh, this is actually the motivation to use like, the portfolio of oil and gas industry. Because normally, like, uh, when you say like, net zero strategy, um, only talking about scope one and scope three. So why are you also so ambitious about scope three? Because we've taken a commitment that, you know, the, the net zero commitment is, is, is concerning all scopes. And I quite agree with Deborah on the mess of computing with scope three, because your scope three on the supply side is my scope three on the, on the, on the sales side. Uh, but uh, for the oil and gas, that's, you know, if we were just saying, oh, you know what, we're going to make sure that all our nice oil and gas client producers, uh, they control their methane leaks. Uh, and, they, and on their pipes and at the, at the well and everything will be fine, it would be uh, completely irrelevant because the, the, where the emissions come, a lot of emissions come there, but a lot, uh, you know, most of it is on, on scope free. I'm Natasha Chemos, student at the SF Business School. I have um, two questions, but the first one is um, also regarding the topic here of divesting from oil and gas company. And I would like to know um, if it has already happened that you've divested really because the client didn't want to um, take um, ambitious sustainability goals. And uh, if you also engage with them uh, in order to help them to improve, and if yes, what is the time that you take for engagement before deciding to divest? So we've already started to engage, uh, you know, um, in the past few years, but we've increased the intensity of engagement, I would say, in the past year, in anticipation of these, uh, you know, official targets, which were only released uh, in September. Uh, and to help the discussion, uh, we've created internally a tool uh, to make the same assessment for all of our clients. So assessments about, okay, what are your commitments, public commitments, uh, the trajectories you set to, 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 to yourselves? How does it benchmark with your peers? So we can see if you're a laggard or if you're, you know, best in class. Um, what are the um, uh, needs that you have uh, in order to, uh, to um, you know, for example, the percentage of your revenues uh, that you, um, uh, of your capex service, of your spending that you want to allocate to develop your new business versus your existing uh, oil and gas business. So we, we, we put all this in the hands of the relationship uh, manager so as to engage in a discussion, gain more information because often companies, especially large public companies, uh, they do not say everything in the public, but they can say some things privately uh, to their bankers and their confidential basis. So we want to make sure we have all the info uh, and these discussions, be, they are taking place right now as we speak. So can I give you an example of companies we've disvested? I'm sure there are a few, but it's more uh, things that are going to happen uh, in the next couple of months on the basis of those discussions. But we want them to be fair discussions because eventually we want them to change. Because if you walk away, it's like if you're a teacher and you say, okay, uh, you suck, you suck, you suck, so you know what, I'm not going to teach you. Uh, I'm just going to teach to the ones uh, that do well. Uh, you're not going to have a good, uh, you're not playing a role as a teacher. So here it's the same. We would like <laughs> to uh, find a way uh, to uh, convince those companies to change. But if the board doesn't want to change, as a, you know, nobody, the leadership doesn't want to change, the shareholders don't want to change, then there's nothing we can do. We are not managing the company. So then we'll just make it clear to them that we won't renew the next uh, revolving credit facility and that we won't participate uh, in transactions with them uh, going forward. So just one more question because yeah. I think we need to be on time. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I am reading uh, on 
de chat au cours de son Moselle Zendi Kadora, ou à la Société Générale Portfolio Targets by 2025, because you didn't mention uh, some. You, you so, yes, so 25, we need to achieve, uh, uh, to reduce by 50% uh, our uh, oil and gas uh, upstream portfolio. So, for example, we are already starting. We've already started to stop financing any uh, new greenfield uh, uh, upstream uh, projects. Uh, and we are going to need to exit <laughs> uh, some uh, relationships or refuse to, uh, to continue, uh, um, uh, even regardless of greenfield projects, uh, lending to uh, uh, ongoing operations, uh, whether it's uh, upstream. Uh, uh, so this one is just uh, upstream. Uh, so on 25, that is one. But it's not because we have not uh, publicized targets for 25 that we don't have targets for 25. We have internal targets for 25. You know what it is, a big public company. You'd better be sure to reach your target uh, if, you, if you set one. So all of these targets, we have yearly targets. And every year we're going to check if we're up or lower and, and we're going to do what it takes to, to make sure we're on the trajectory to meet the, the public targets. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I would now like to introduce Caroline Nemo from Amundi. I think it's a good opportunity to talk about engagement. Uh, yeah. yeah. Continuation. Uh, Do you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, it's okay. So I'm working for Amundi. Amundi is the largest asset manager in Europe. Uh, one, uh, it's among the 10 biggest uh, worldwide. What is different from a, a bank? An asset manager basically manage money for third parties, so for our clients. And it will make an important when you think of net zero strategy. So I try to... Uh, to give you some input around where is the market for asset management and also because we are always discussing ESG backlash and I'm traveling a lot. So, sorry for my carbon <laughs> footprint. Uh, and what I figure out is basically is a US problems, but apart from the US, nobody uh, that I met was really um, doing any ESG backlash. So just to keep it uh, positive. So, I mean, the market uh, regarding ESG in the uh, asset management side and investment side is quite dynamic. Uh, what we see is more and more RFP have some kind of ESG uh, embedded. Um, and also the fact that what has been very really the differences uh, uh, lately is that uh, there is more and more regulation and I will uh, I will have a slide on those one. Uh, on regulation, it's a, a strong driver on the market. Important, uh, obviously, emerging market is difficult, and you will see that this is a clear, uh, a clear mar um, emerging market is very important going forward. So we need to find solution to finance their own transition and to adapt our framework to their realities. Um, so, globally, more and more, you have this uh, net zero product emerging. Um, you also have more impact-driven uh, solutions that are created for clients to be able to invest, and I will come back to that. Uh, globally, as an asset manager, so we are a signatory of the NetZ Asset Manager Alliance. I don't know if there are many alliances going from the G Fund. So you have the Banking Alliance, you have the Asset Owner Alliance, you have the Insurance Alliance, even if this one is a little bit uh, tricky lately, uh, and the Banking Alliance, and you have the Asset Manager Alliance. Why you have difference? Because each uh, type of uh, uh, financial body as in own drivers. So an asset manager as he is only created product to uh, to manage money for third parties or for clients he can't have the same type of uh, of target as a bank uh, or as an asset owner. So globally, uh, the in our net zero. Uh, framework is how we see things as an asset manager. 
First, you have all the investment part, which is investment solution, where by definition, we are going to, and we are uh, creating some new offering or changing uh, one portfolio to a net zero portfolio. So it would be portfolio that they have in their uh, legal uh, documents some, some, uh, some objective to be aligned with a net zero scenario. So usually you, they will follow some kind of Paris line benchmark or this kind of thing. So we will have a clear view of the transition parts toward net zero. You also have uh, impact solutions. So it could be um, uh, green bond solutions. It could be uh, uh, social bonds, even if it's not net zero. Uh, this kind of, of things are, are having a lot of momentum from clients, especially in emerging market space. And then you have what we call a specific uh, topic where we have a team up with some uh, international um, bodies like uh, the IFC, uh, the AIAB, uh, the EIB, to create some specific product, especially in the emerging market space, where, for example, the IFC will take uh, a kind of the, 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 the highest risk. So it's a structure product. So it enables our clients to have exposure to emerging markets with a lower uh, risk. Because one of the problem of the, uh, the financial markets is our, our clients, they have some kind of guidelines. They can't do whatever they want. First, because they have some liabilities they have to cover. They have to re they have a risk. Uh, they have to have a return and to, to, to control their risk. So the first thing, they can do whatever they want. And also they are, they are re highly regulated. So when you think most of our clients they are they are, they are insurance company, highly regulated. They are pension funds, highly regulated, especially in France and in Europe. And then you have uh, retail clients. They are not regulated themselves, but they have regulators because the local regulators are really controlling what we are allowed to sell to retailers. That's why uh, um, to invest in emerging market, most of our clients have difficulties. So, you know, uh, they will probably have uh, some kind of exposure to the more advanced among the emerging markets. But when you are looking at Africa, when you are looking at a less advanced country in Asia or in South America, probably they will have some restrictions uh, of investment there. So that's why this kind of products are targeting, uh, are aiming at developing uh, an, another solution which enable normal clients to invest with us. So this is the kind of pro, uh, an offering that uh, we, we do. Another topic which is really important is engaging with our own clients. This is something which is important because, as I said, we are only managing money for third parties. Is the, if the third party doesn't want to align that portfolio with a net zero scenario, there is no way for us to do it. So the first thing is discuss with our clients on how uh, it will benefit to them to uh, take into this into account. And in the discussion, we have to cover three things. So the alignment, but the risk and the return. Because at the end of the day, for each of our clients, there will be an individual. Why? Because pension funds is to finance pension uh, for individuals. So at the end of the day, you know, um, we, they need this money. So we can't uh, create some products that will create some risk that they miss the, their, their first target, which is to pay pension. Same for insurance companies. Uh, so this is more product, the way the, 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 the kind of discussion we have with our clients, what is important also is to avoid uh, the more risky uh, t um, companies. And so that's why we have minimum uh, uh, standards. And uh, you were uh, mentioning about, uh, you know, divestment. This is the divestment part. And 
you know, you, you have some, I mean, divestment is always, uh, I would say, a failure somehow, because when you, um, you divest, you can't really dialogue anymore with a company normally if you are active. Uh, and, you know, we tend to think that it's a last uh, resort. The only thing is Amundi is big in uh, ETF and passive investments. So to be honest, we are never divesting because you can divert, divest from your active offering. But if your clients want you to, uh, to manage uh, MSCI China, a product, you will have to be exposed to uh, even the company you divest. But I will cover this afterwards. And then we are also, uh, because part of the difficulties uh, for clients to uh, go to their net zero strategy is to understand what's going on with their portfolios. There's, uh, they need to have a lot of data and also having some tool to, uh, to, uh, to uh, deal with those data. And so we have uh, some internal tool that we are offering, uh, that we are selling as So this is the investment part. The second part that I will uh, cover would be on the engagement with issuers. And this is uh, something that we are doing a lot. Uh, so we, in 20, it was not in 2022, the bailers was 2021. We had a baseline where at, this, at the time we were uh, engaging with 464 companies. You know, it's so hard that we have one company by one company. We have a target to, uh, to add 1,000 on the top of the 464 uh, by 2025. The idea there is we think that we should somehow uh, engage with all companies that at least are in our active uh, offering. So 1,000 is around, so 1,500 is around what it will be, it's a little bit higher, but you know, uh, target is, uh, is like this. Um, and why we want to that? Because in fact, the, the, the view that we have that the, the investor community has engaged a lot oil and gas company, utilities, all this high uh, emitter sector for years and years. And the problem when you're engaged with oil and gas company at the end is scope three, because Yes, scope three is important in oil and gas, but at the same time, uh, they can have some kind of impact on their scope three, but they don't have the 100% of the impact. So what you can ask them is, um, is uh, you know, do it their fair share, but the more uh, useful and what is our experience is, if you engage simultaneously with their clients and their clients are moving, then the oil and gas company are going to accelerate. So that's why we think, because the scope three of the oil and gas company is the scope one of another. So we really need to engage all sectors. Because we, what we figure out, there are some sectors, they, they clearly believe that they don't need to, <laughs> to have any climate strategy, which is wrong. Um, so that is uh, the reason of the strategy. Uh, and already we are covering 71% of the high emissions. Uh, um, and we truly believe that by, by engaging all sectors, we will accelerate the transition of the high impact sectors. Um, obviously, coal is something that is still really important to act on. I know that in France, when you are based in France, you, we always discuss oil and gas and a particular company not far away from here. But I mean, you know, the thing is, the real problem on the world today is still coal. And it's not because we don't have uh, no more coal or almost no more coal in France or in Europe. That is the, is the, the truth in, in globally. And we, we still need to uh, to fight the coal, and coal is really important. So that's why we engage all the company, all of them, when they have coal exposure. And it's, uh, it's a big uh, topic for us. Um, alignment with our own practices is really important. So uh, we, we were the first asset manager to have a say on climate. It was in 2022, we did have our exposed say on climate in 2023. Um, 
why it's important to stay on climate? First, because we ask that to the company. So we, we said, so because we ask that for the others, let's have it. And it's a way to, uh, to be forced to have a, a strong uh, climate strategy and ask your shareholders to vote on it. So on this uh, strategy, because we are, uh, we are how I say, like, we are managing for third parties, we can't say, I'm going to lower my scope one my scope two, my scope three by expert percent because we don't control the our asset allocation. So I mean we don't know what the clients who are going to win in the next five years. If we if we win a lot of emerging market uh, uh, mandate by construction, our scope one is going to increase, and scope two is going to increase. So, you know, it's what we control is um, our offering and the mean that we are taking and all the engagement we are doing with issuers. That's why that our strategy is based on um, incentivized. So all the top 20, uh, 200 people of the company, all the sales force, all the investment professionals have some kind of ESG slash climate targeting their uh, compensation. It's trained, we are training a lot from our board, the EXCO and all the workforce. We have a program where it's cover ESG and climate. Uh, and we have specific training for, for investment professionals. Uh, of course, we are lowering our carbon footprint, but to be honest, it, it, it won't change the world on that, but at least we need to do the, the work. Um, and uh, we have our TCFD report, obviously. But as a, to be honest, as a French company, as we are, we need to do the article 29. It's not a big effort. Um, this is really important because usually people are always discussing about Europe the European regulations, the European regulation, and again, the European regulation. And when you have some US-based uh, colleagues, it's quite tough because you always say, okay, the US uh, is, uh, it doesn't have the same view in Europe. And so sometimes we need to, to uh, look more about Asia and the rest of the world, which are really important. And I think it's really important to have this in mind uh, that there is different uh, dynamics there. So you have the uh, European regulation, by definition, it's made on double materiality, it's really important. Um, so this is a slide I, I made for, for, for uh, my last trip in Asia, so that's why you have a lot of Asian uh, references, but for me Asia is key for our net zero trip. Um, so, you know, it's true that the, the, the European way of double mortality is, uh, might be a little bit challenging for, for a lot of non-European uh, non uh, region. Nevertheless, when you are looking at the, the latest regulation, it's what we call extraterritorial, meaning that uh, some of the regulation, European regulation, are going to be uh, applicable on uh, Asian company, US companies, if they have any kind of activity in Europe. First, so it would be a serious CSD. The big regulation that is coming is called CS3D. Uh, it's just like a foreign language. You have to, <laughs> to discuss regulation. This is really important because globally what he said is, if you are, have any kind of activity in Europe, you need to make sure that uh, you, you do your reason, reasonable due diligence in your supply chain. And we know when you are looking climate, when we are looking on biodiversity, when you are looking at human rights, the, the, uh, the most important problem that we, we are facing when we are, want to manage that is the supply chain. But the regulators will oblige the, the company to, uh, to do their minimum uh, due diligence. And this one, even in Asia, they are already uh, aware of that. For example, they are already aware that because in Europe we have this no deforestation target that they need to prove when they are since they want to still to sell to Europe, uh, which is a big market, by the way, they need to uh, prove that they have uh, zero deforestation, same for human rights. So even if it's only covering Europe, 
it will still have an institutional um, uh, impact. Then you have the ISSB, and it's uh, there is a, a big uh, discussion in my team about is it double materiality or single materiality, and this is a, a, a big discussion. And I, I choose to, to, to put it on the double materiality, but I accept the challenge. I think the thing is, is double materiality, if there's some kind of uh, financial materiality, but financial materiality for ISSB is something that will have an impact globally on the economy. So, uh, so it's not just the, the definition of the single materiality uh, outside in. It's also its cover inside out, like human rights and so on. And then you have the U.S. This one is uh, something else. I think when you are looking at the different regulation, and I think it's important because it, it's driven the market, the dynamic of the market. You see that, yes, in Europe, we have a lot of regulation. You have more and more regulation. but. UK is, uh, is working a lot to have more regulations. Uh, what is important is Asia. You see that the, the more advanced, uh, like uh, China, Hong Kong, and Singapore, are, are really working quite, uh, quite actively uh, on some kind of regulation. You see that Singapore will uh, announce their taxonomy uh, quite uh, soon. Uh, Hong Kong is uh, always uh, challenging, is always fighting with uh, Singapore to, uh, to be the heart of uh, finance in, in, uh, in Asia. And China uh, have their own uh, taxonomy. So they are quite active in this. Uh, India starting is, um, is drilling, and Japan, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, they are uh, starting to, uh, to have their own travel regarding, um, uh, regarding uh, regulation. So why I'm discussing about Asia? Because I think sometimes when we are based in Europe, we tend to be Europe-centric or to look a lot in, uh, towards the U.S. And I think it's really important to, uh, to go back to Asia, because part of the fact that we are going to succeed on our net zero alignment is related to Asia. It's important to, uh, to know what are their um, environmental uh, environment and what is important for them and what is the dynamic there. And this is the kind of uh, four dynamics that we see in Asia. And it's all related at some point to the net zero. Uh, and you say, why I put climate and nature at first? Because when you are looking at the, uh, the report for the World Bank on uh, biodiversity loss, uh, globally, uh, the World Bank say it's, it's a scenario, it's uh, uh, an average, but globally, uh, the, the, um, the, if we do nothing, the biodiversity loss will cost around 2.3 GDP points by 2030. So, not good. But the thing is, in advanced countries, so like for example in France, it's only minus 0.7. If you are looking in the less advanced, it could be up to 7 points. So, very huge. And Asia will be the region with Africa that will be the most hit by that. So that's why this is really important. And in Asia, they are already feeling this. They are already feeling the physical risk and the cost of physical risk. This is really important. It's true that in Europe, we are discussing less on that. But from a financial perspective, those two are really key. Then you have the energy transition, uh, our alignment. And in Asia, the cold phase out is really important. How are we going to finance this, this phase out, the acceleration of the phase out? And then it's related to physical risk and energy transition, just transition and just resilience. How are we going to finance the fact that people there uh, could switch from work uh, still, you know, have some, uh, you know, some growth uh, because we can't stop the growth in Asia. 
um, it's not uh, an option because, you know, with no growth, we, you will have more poverty. Just think of uh, the no growth situation will always hurt the, more, the, the poorest people. Same for physical risk. Everything, I mean, it's always the poorest who, uh, we are, which are hurt. It's really important uh, on that. And uh, another thing which uh, re is really important is the, so we use a lot of the International Energy <laughs> Agency scenario because it's useful, because it's a scenario where you have some growth embedded. So it's really important because as, a, as an investor, if there's no growth, it's quite a problem for us. And also so because uh, without growth, the, the social impact of the transition will be so high that we, are done, we don't know how we are going to deal with it. That's why this scenario is the most important. There were uh, an, up, uh, an update, I can't remember, it's late September or beginning of October, of the International Energy uh, Net Zero Scenario. And what is important? is what they change. They, 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 they change a little bit of what they said was important. They are fine at this is that the good thing is it's still possible. Uh, the second good thing is there were an acceleration in uh, renewable projects. So they think that the electrification is possible for this decade, which is important. And all of the other things are bad things, but we want to focus on the positive. So four priorities, and methane is becoming the, is one of the, uh, the big priorities so for oil and gas companies, but not only, uh, also for all kind of uh, gas utilities. And uh, I mean, even us at home, if you have any gas uh, um, heating, you can uh, have some methane. So just in this, this is really important. Um, and the, what they see is everything is uh, the reason why they have this review is because they see an, an acceleration in the electrification. And this is their big uh, scenario. And that's where they, uh, how would say, I don't know if you see in the newspaper, but they had some nice and uh, uh, debate through newspaper between the some oil and gas uh, companies and the International Energy Agency on the single uh, assessment, which is, is the electrification accelerating or not? Because this will be a high impact on the oil demand. So what they have changed, they have increased in their scenario the, the, the weight of solar, decreased the wind, why they have decreased the wind? Because late, they are just looking at the, the, the different project and they see there is many difficulties in the wind uh, supply chain and they think that as solar is cheaper, they, they, they lower the, the, the level of, uh, of wind and uh, they, they increase uh, slightly nuclear. One of the not so good things uh, is the fact that coal uh, the, the decrease of coal is not as high as the, the first thought would be. So we, we still have a problem with coal. Uh, and what, why yeah, it's important is the level of investment in renewable energies that we need to do collectively in emerging market is really, really important. This is the key for, for our success is to be able to finance uh, in emerging markets. Um, and going, okay, sorry. Because it will engage precisely on the next presentation about renewable energy. Okay. So, how, when you are an investor, how you can do, so you, you know, you can create some product, we have a lot of brain bones and so on. One topic that we are doing is engaging with this Europe. What, why we are doing it, a little bit like the banks is because the real impact, so the impact of real life is also through the, the way companies are going to, uh, to improve by themselves. And at the end of the day, we don't want the portfolio to be the cleanest, we want real life to be <laughs> the cleanest. So what we, when we are engaging, we have four uh, targets. One is discuss target and transition plan and assess uh, if the targets are strong, um, 
we always look at in, uh, investment plans, so CapEx. Why? Because as collectively, we need to increase a lot of CapEx. We are looking if the company are increasing CapEx in order to match the global needs. Because somehow, uh, we, we, we want, you know, for example, if a company was, uh, I mean, for example, they are investing in brown, in oil and gas. <laughs> if they give back the, they, they stop investing and they give back the money to the investors, it won't be not efficient for us. Why? Because then we need to find uh, some new project to invest and the investor will go through phones and it's, it will create a lot of difficulties. Whereas those guys, they, they are used to uh, do big project and they can do the project by themselves. So what we are doing is we are engaging a lot with them to ask them to increase their own investment in renewable energy, to shift their business model from oil and gas, oil and gas towards new energy. Then we are looking at just transition, which is really important, and transparency. Why um, just, uh, just transition is obvious. We, we think they need to, to uh, train their workforce. They, they need to, uh, to, to shift in a way where it doesn't create social, negative social impact. Transparency, why? Because when you are an investor, uh, we, we are dealing with a lot of issues. We need comparability. If not, uh, it's, we are unable to deal with the amount of data we need to assess. So transparency is really important because we need to have a lot of data and we need to increase the comparability. So what we will uh, ask them, for example, is to make sure that they, they disclose uh, using the CDP uh, that they, they, they normalize the way they are, they, are, um, they are disclosing and also that they don't put their target in the many reports, but uh, in, a, in, in a format where we can use it. Because we are doing a lot of modeling. Uh, so this is a kind of, in, I mean, this is statistics. So we engage more than 2,000 uh, unique issues per year. And you see, we do a lot of climate and math, but we also cover other topics, which is important is this one, is the last slide. Uh, this is an example with a company, so it's Japanese utilities company. Uh, it's a company, in Japan, the, we have a, a, a spike difficulties with, uh, with Japanese utilities because in our policy, we want a company to phase out from coal. And by 2030 is if, if they are in OECD. So the problem is Japan didn't announce any, um, any phase out for the time being. So this company is not phasing out and has a high level of coal. So this company is excluded from our active uh, uh, offering, but we are still in ETF and passive offering. So we are still engaging with the company together with some peers. And what we have done is the, the company did this big 2050 net zero announcements. So, okay, they are, they are to be, uh, to be uh, net zero by 2050. The problem is, is based in a quite substantial uh, manner to, uh, to compensation. And we don't want that, especially for utilities, because utilities, they are not hard to abate a sector, so we don't really want that. And especially uh, in Japan, where you will have some offshore carbon capture, where, you know, we don't know if the technology will work. So what we have done is we have engaged a lot with the companies. They did some progress, but not enough. And then what we have done is uh, we have co-filed two years in a row some uh, some resolution in the IAGM to ask them to accelerate on the company. And uh, the thing is, you know, the engagement is very long, so we are still not there. They are still slow. Uh, you have to see that uh, a company is not changing that, uh, overnight, especially this kind of company which are very related to the Japanese uh, strategy. Our belief is at some point, if we engage a lot, 
uh, this company, if we engage the Japanese government, if you engage the banks, uh, the Japanese banks, at some point, they will understand that they will have a problem. They will, the, the Japanese government will shift their strategy, but it's a long uh, shot. But I didn't want to uh, show uh, a successful uh, engagement because, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's better for you to understand that it's not always uh, pinky and uh, easy. That's all. Thank you. So for the sake of time, I think we're going to continue with the presentations and leave the questions for the, for the cocktail that we have after. And it's also the perfect switch for two for talking about renewable energies and how they are important and probably the key factor of success for decarbonization. Disconnect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'm Pierre-Antoine Machelon, an alumni of uh, ESSEC. Uh, very happy to share with you this vision on renewable. Eiffel is an asset manager, of course, not the same size as AMD uh, or SubGen. Maybe some supplier of some small funds to those people. And uh, we focus on energy transition. This is one of our two pillars. Uh, beside uh, corporate credit. Uh, is that the way I'm... No. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, what I'm going to tell you today is very concrete examples of what we're doing, especially on bridge debt, bridge equity strategies with the view of showing how we can accelerate, how we can bring additionality, how our euros are efficient in the world. Um, second focus I would like to share with you is how the regulations that our, my colleague explained change our way, our day-to-day -day way of working. SFDR9, taxonomy, all these buzzwords, they create a very, a real impact on our day-to-day -day life as, as an analyst or uh, investment officer in general. So I'm not very good at this, okay. I will not spend too much time, but the point here is to show how the green objective is meeting both strategic and economic objectives. Here about strategy, green, having green energy in Europe means being more independent from external resources. Not to build PV, because we, we need China to build PV plants, but then when we've built those plants, we don't need to import fossil fuel. It's extremely important, given the current uh, change in uh, geopolitics. Second thing is, Green energy is not only good because it's green, it's also good because it's costing less than traditional fossil fuel-based energy. You see how solar and wind are on the left-hand side versus gas and coal in terms of uh, long-term cost uh, curves. Um, and all this is uh, then coming to this conclusion. We need to um, not double, not treble, but maybe treble or multiply by four, our annual investments. So this is not the stock, this is the flow. So we need to multiply by three or four our annual investments. So if we were investing 100 million this year, we need to invest 300 million maybe in 2025. This is huge. The um, green, Share is a European share. So we are uh, dealing with euros that are not trebling or multiplied by four. So all our job at AFL is to see how we can make our euros more efficient. An update that may be of an interest for you is that uh, we have a good thing with PV, with solar, is that of course, interest rates are going up so the cost of money is very, very strong. You know that for a PV asset, what is important is cost of your money and cost of real estate. This is the two main resources you use 
uh, to, to make a PV plant. But CapEx is going down and electricity prices are much higher than before crisis. So this equation is uh, globally positive. Now, what are we doing at EFL? We are, we are focusing on what was highlighted as one of the four targets, I think, in, in, in the former presentation, funding gap. Funding gap means we try to the position where there's not so much euro is coming because traditional fund providers are not happy um, bringing money for a short period of time. That's one reason. And second reason, bringing money at a time when there's quite a lot of risk. Quite a lot of risk is uh, what we show here in the shaded area, which is what we call development stage for a typical renewable uh, program. Uh, when you want to have a so photovoltaic plant, PV plant, you first need to secure your real, your real estate, um, your connection uh, to, to the grid, and this and your uh, permit, your permit to build. These three things may be long, uh, boring, and risky. And although it does not cost too much, it is key. Because if you don't start with this, you will never get a PV plan. And we've decided last year to launch a fund on this because we felt that there was no fund available for that. And of course, we don't do that only for making good things. It's because as there's not so much cash available, there's good return to be extracted. Second reason I gave you is lending for a short period of time. That was my presentation of two years ago, I think. It, uh, when you run a fund, you usually invest for four, five, eight years. If you invest for two or three years, you need to make two or three times a job. This is the reason why you don't have so many funds focusing on this. And this is the reason why we did, because we found that there was a need. And again, as there's a need, there's a return to be extracted. So this is um, relevant for the development, and this is relevant as well for the construction period. When you construct your plant and you make sure you have a nice portfolio, so you don't construct one plant, you construct 10 or 15, so that at the end of the day, or at the end of the year, actually, you have a nice portfolio to be refinanced at much better terms, because it's a big size and because it's up and running. With, for construction, we do it with debt, because that's not so much risk. For development, we do it with equity. But both cases, we go for rather short tenor, and um, yeah, we, 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 we call that bridge. So in a nutshell, uh, over the last five or six years, we invested uh, in this strategy of a bridge, and here I'm calling bridge depth figures, 1.5 billion. Here's the first, as a first uh, additionality. We only raised 500 million, and we invested 1.5 billion. Why then? Because of recycling. Because we, we land for a short period of time, so we get the money back and we reinvest. And then, seven gigawatt. In Europe, in a year, you know how many gigawatt of uh, PV plants we, we build? 50. So seven gigawatt is something. Why then? Because if we do invest in the construction period, a, the, the money that is not available at this time, we are key for the, for, for the project. If, if we were not to be there, it would have to be the equity of the sponsor to be invested, and usually equity is not there. So with only a fraction of a, the, 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 the cost of the project that we finance, we make the project happen. They, they get some sources of financing, but not enough to complete the project. So this, this means why with 1.5 billion, we could build seven gigawatt, because if, because we don't finance 100% of the project, we do, just do provide what is needed to complete the financing. 
Well, this is five million, five million households. You know, this is a population of uh, a bit more than 10 million people. So it starts to be something like just seven jiggle. Now, what the, you, you see how we did spread out in Europe, what we did in terms of households being powered, emissions being avoided. Now, there are two things that I was mentioning that are new in our world, which is supply chain. That was highlighted in the previous uh, discussion. It's been a year, a year and a half, uh, since we've had a look, a specific look, at how those modules are produced because of SFDR, taxonomy. We must care about how uh, the things we financed are supplied. And you, you may know that there's been a lot of controversy about how those modules are manufactured in China with, um, with uh, yeah, I'm coming to all, all um, forced labor. Forced labor, thank you. <laughs> um, so we used a number of uh, ratings, a number of uh, reports, certificates. Uh, we have a multi, uh, multi criteria uh, methodology in order to rate different suppliers to reject some, some of them. This is the reason why we did reject some transactions this year. And we do have to update this because that's not because you judged a, a supplier well in months of January that in September it's still okay. But we come up with a, a five tier um, a way of rating those suppliers. That's one thing. Um, the uh, double materiality, what does that mean? That was highlighted as well. It means you don't have to care only on the impacts you have on your environment. You have to, to care about the impact of your environment on your project. So you may not be able to read because it's too, too small, but here it's temperatures. This is what we talked about this morning on a committee, risk of flooding. We, we finance, uh, here it's not PV, it's, uh, it's biogas plant in, uh, in Italy. And biogas, you made it from agricultural waste. Agricultural waste has to come from agricultural place. And it is close to the river. If it's close to the river, then you've got a risk of flooding. And so we have, due to the regulation in Europe now, to check about this, to tell our investors how we did but take into account this risk. And this is not just like, it, 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 it is possible. We all know this today in the northern part of France, there's a lot of flooding, and, and that may harm the operations of what we are financing. This is rather new. This is coming from the new regulation we have had since uh, two years, I think, or three years now. Um, this is, no more the example, this is a framework. Uh, we, as SFDR9 regulated for our funds, we have to intend our investments with one, or one key objective, here is climate change mitigation. We have to check for each and every investment that we comply with uh, the 14 principle adverse impact check, for that we are uh, complying not only with green things, it's about having diversity at the board level, for example, for the company, so having enough female uh, representation, having uh, uh, checking the uh, work um, incidents, for example, oh, oh, so, so, things like this. This is as I said, yeah, taxonomy means we don't have to, you should not harm any of the environmental objective and social safeguards. And this is because of this that we check about the origin of our PV modules in China. Then there is a rather ample room to do what we think we should do. You heard on the last presentation, reasonable diligence. The reasonable diligence, what is it? And this is where our commercial momentum brings us to do things that we think are right. We, we succeed in raising money because we can convince our clients that we do things that are really more than reasonable. And five years ago, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have won a 
client with this. Now there's yes. The sign is that this morning we had a, uh, no, it was yesterday, we had a, a, a meeting with one of the most prominent um, institutions in France on ESG. Five years ago, only the junior staff would have come. It, it was here, it was the response, CIO actually, who came to the meeting. This is really a difference. So this is what we, what we do. If you check our slides, you, you will have noticed that three slides before we had written five, now we, in here we write four, it's because things are changing. We didn't update the slide, I'm sorry, but that, that, that's the impact of what we've done with our energy transition uh, strategies. Now, what I wanted to do with you is focusing, if I have some time, on two examples of what we're doing on bridge debt, bridge equity. I don't know if you remember, bridge debt to fund construction, bridge equity to fund development. Here it is about funding to construction. But what we're doing is that, um, if you, here it's an example of a German sponsor, doesn't have to do much things, but has is small, it doesn't have an access to big, to big guys, so it doesn't have an access to capital. So you want you to uh, build five megawatts of uh, solar plants. Five megawatt is not big, it's five hectares, approximately. And what we did is we provided uh, something which is here, which is uh, shaded here. It's 4.2 million out of 5.2 million of cash for a rather short period of time because we were refining seven or 12 months later when the project was sold to somebody who didn't want to care about construction. And finding an investment, a, a financing for seven to 12 months is absolutely not possible. So if we were not there, we would, the guy would have to fund that with equity. And then he would have built five times less PV plants versus this scenario. Now, you check that, it was three years ago. We charged 7.5%, which is huge, because what a senior bank would, would charge would be two or 3% at this time. Now you have to add 400 basis points because of a euro, <laughs> but, the, but ju just this is a five to 600 basis points increase versus what a regular bank would provide, but it's still below the cost of equity that would have to be there if we were not there. So we all find our balance, I would say. Uh, still one, one, uh, 1,500 households thing being uh, provided with a renewable energy. Now another thing is uh, providing not bridge debt but bridge equity. So here, we, you see the difference. It was five megawatt, here it's 300 megawatt. Okay, it's 20, mega, 20 million, not five, but you see it's not the same kind of multiplier. Why is it such an additionality? It's because when you are in the development stage, you don't have to provide the modules, you don't have to provide the, uh, the, the material. You have to provide for the cost of doing the studies, of, do, of paying uh, the, the sculptures around uh, the country to find the land. All this is, uh, maybe not too costly, but costly enough to be a, rest uh, a restrictive factor for the sponsor, because it can only do finance that with equity. And, and the point here is to provide this equity for a relatively short period of time, because the development may last three, four, five years in Europe, by six, seven, eight years in France, but we are an exception. So what do we do here? Um, is that we finance most of the costs, so 60,000 euro per megawatt, to be compared to 10 times more to build. But still, 60,000 euro per megawatt is still some money. And we have the opportunity to uh, have a big portfolio to diversify our investment, which is key in the, in the investment uh, strategy, of course. And what we do is that we, um, create a joint venture that is usually 50-50 with, with the developer, and we do provide 
most of the funding needs and we benefit from a priority then when funds are uh, redeemed because the project is sold. Um, and of course, there are a lot of uh, things to care about in the governance. So just an example of yeah, what one of the four projects that we did, one of the four portfolios that we did finance this year with this new fund. Um, so that's all for me. The funding group. <laughs> questions for Good. the presentation. So thank you very much, Pierre. Um, last presentation is going to be from Alan F. So Alan F is a new professor at ESSEC. He's joined recently in environmental economics and has very interesting uh, work on this issue and is going to present one piece of his work. Missing Windows Windows Windows. Okay. okay, um yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me. I think I'm the last presentation before the drinks and I think I think the Vincenzo's gonna say something as well or uh, in fact I think we have uh, there was a problem with the Okay. So you have to. <laughs> okay. So when your boss is talking, usually you have to be short. But now everything's fine. So yeah, but I don't want to keep you too long before the drinks. So I'll talk to you about the price of offsetting carbon, uh, and this is actually some joint work with uh, Patrick Jukam, who's there. Uh, he was uh, an intern with me when uh, I was uh, at the central bank in France, and uh, magically we somehow both moved to a sec and uh, we meet again here. And so he's uh, he's part of uh, one of the researchers behind this work. The other person is. Uh, Nina Friggen, she's an expert in uh, trees, so she goes into the forest, measures how much tree CO2 is capture, and uh, that's her main job. And so she, she's sort of the scientific validation of some of the things here. Uh, yeah, I won't say too much nonsense. Okay, so, um, so to, to the conference today was about net zero. Uh, there you go. Um, and so, so the question is why net zero, right? So what's, what's the net about? And I think we had some presentations talking about this already, uh, and I tend to use way too many memes in my presentation, some. I'm apologizing in advance for that, so hopefully. Yeah. And so, yeah, the question is, what, what is this net all about, right? And so, uh, um, so these are the scenarios of the IPCC, so the International Panel on Climate Change. And as you can see, um, there's something happening here, right? So this is the scenarios for all greenhouses, and this is only CO2. And what you can see is that some of these scenarios, they go below zero, right? So you can see the zero here, <laughs> it's just, uh, and they actually go below zero. And so the question is, you know, how do you create a negative emission, right? So, and that's sort of what Gandalf is asking. You. What are negative emissions? Sounds a bit puzzling, right? So, how could you remove CO2? And that's sort of what I'm focusing on. Um, in this paper, so it's a paper I'm basing this on, we have three ways of reducing CO2. Um, and one is through tax, and that's great. So, you can use a carbon tax or a trading mechanism like in Europe. But the problem with this is that you don't reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, but you just do the price on something. So, it's great, but it doesn't really reduce the actual CO2. Well, the other thing you can do is you can plant trees, so that's called afforestation. Uh, that's very cheap, but uh, we're on a very tiny planet, right? And so there's very little space to do that. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some maps uh, on how, how small the planet is. And then the last thing you can do uh, is carbon capture and storage, uh, or one of the things you can do. And that's great, but there's two problems with it. It's very expensive, so now it's around uh, $1,000 per ton. I will sort of put this into perspective to see uh, how, how much that is. And the other problem is you actually need energy to capture carbon, right? So uh, if you use uh, oil to capture CO2 produced by uh, burning oil, it gets a bit tricky, right? Because then you're just putting more oil to get more oil, and then you sort of don't do anything uh, constructive. So it only works if you have a source of natural energy that you can use. Uh, so for, for example, the okra plant in Iceland is next to a, a natural heat uh, source, which then creates some, uh, some, some of, the, of the technology there. But so it's a very, it's a very promising, or it's, a lot of people hope this would work, but for now, uh, it's not really working. So I think the most realistic thing to do is to plant trees. And then so in the second part of the presentation, I'll show you how realistic it is and what the limitations are. Okay, and so, so I think, yeah, what the IPCC has in mind, what a lot of positive and optimistic people, which we all are, and we all have this in our cognitive dissonance, we want the future to be bright, right? And so we all think of new technologies. I have one that I really much like, and so I've asked uh, DALI, so the ChatGPT is smaller than the brother, 
uh, to draw it for me. So it's the CO2 unicorn. Uh, so how does it work? So you have CO2 that's emitted, and then it's transformed into rainbows. And that's a very effective strategy. It's very fast, and you can use it anywhere. Uh, the problem is it's still in development, so I have some patents pending, but they're not there yet, right? So uh, unless we can use this, we're sort of stuck with trees. Okay. And so, so I'm going to do two things in the rest of the presentation. First, I'm going to tell you uh, how much it would cost to offset uh, the scope three of fossil fuel companies. So we've talked a lot of, about scope three, so this is what your customer burns, so that's the energy we use here, or in your car, so that's what you burn when you use products from a fossil fuel company. So that's their oil, their gas, their coal. Uh, and I'm going to see how much that costs to us, the society, to do this. Um, and to, to bear with me, you have to take on a few assumptions. Uh, so first, that's the one I said, you need to talk about scope three only, right? So the, the, the CO2 from burning the product of fossil fuel companies. Um, and then we have to bear in mind that this has a cost. So I told you between around five dollars uh, per ton of CO2 if you use the red reforestation projects and that doesn't include the cost of land, to a to thousand dollars if you try to do direct air capture, so carbon capture and storage. Um, and, uh, and the other thing you have to bear in mind in these calculations is instead of looking at the annual flows of CO2, we look at the company's balance sheet and we look at their reserves of oil and gas, and then we transform these reserves into CO2, and that's on their balance sheet. And so the idea is if you have some uh, reserves on your balance sheet, well, on the other side, you might have a liability of a risk of a tax or a risk of having to offset in the future. And that's how we sort of reason there. So we say, look, what if this company had today to offset all the carbon on their balance sheet, how much would they have to pay? And another way to ask this question is to say, well, what's the value of this company to society, right? Because we all want to offset carbon, because we all want to stay on this beautiful planet, right? So we have to offset carbon eventually. And to do that, we'll have to offset the carbon in the reserves of fossil fuel companies if you want to avoid uh, more global warming. And so, we do this with a simple equation, uh, which you know, looks much more fancy than it actually is. Uh, so we, we create something we call the net ecological value of a company. So that's the, the value of the company minus how much they would have to pay to offset the CO2 they're producing. And so um, there's a lot of strong assumptions. So what we say, we take the market capitalization of a company uh, and we remove the CO2 reserve times the offsetting price. So that's the cost they have to pay to offset their CO2, and we move that from their market cap. And the question we're essentially asking is, do these companies have any value after we have to, they would have to be clean? Uh, and that's sort of the, the headline results. So the, the beautiful thing is that zero, uh, all the, that's a percentage of company on this side, and here it's a cost of offsetting. And the question we ask, how many, which percentage of the companies still have a positive value. So which one have a positive book value once they've paid for the harm they do to the environment, so once they've offset their carbon. And you can see at zero, obviously, they all have a positive value. And already around 16, so that's one of the uh, UN costs for afforestation, you get 36% of the companies have a negative value. So they mean that they don't bring value to society anymore. And once you get to $83, which is the average you paid on European uh, ETS uh, trading, you, you get to uh, 95 companies, fossil fuel companies, so we took the 200 largest, so 95% uh, of the largest fossil fuel companies lose their value. And so that's quite interesting, and then if you go uh, at the carbon uh, storage price, which is down there, uh, around 1,000, right, you just, like, uh, then you'd be at, obviously still at zero companies having a negative value. So I think that's quite humbling, it shows you that uh, fourth, and, and, and again, that's compared to the market cap, right? So. Uh, if you think that's even if they would lose 50% of their market cap to pay uh, to offset their carbon, that would still be too much to keep on running uh, as a profitable company, if we could guess. So I'm not sure what the threshold would be, but, but these are really the worst case scenario where these companies have a negative value. So, so uh, holders of the equity would sell it straight away. So you would have a negative value. And again, so that's more of a, a theoretical um, calculation, but it just gives you an idea of va what value uh, fossil fuel companies can bring to society. Um, and so we have, so I think that's sort of the idea. And so it's a way to use uh, scope three CO2 to count what, what value these companies bring. And if you take an example with Total, for example, uh, well, they have roughly uh, 4.25 gigatons in their reserves of CO2. So that's the equivalent of the oil they have. Um, if you would have, if you'd buy a credit on the European market to offset that, you'd pay 353 billion. That's at today's market cap. I've done the calculation just a bit earlier. 
And then uh, the actual market cap of Total is 150 billion euros. So that means um, <clears throat> if today they would offset all their carbon, the company would be worth less, uh, minus 150 billion euros more or less, right? Uh, so, so it's showing that this company only has value because we don't force it to pay for the externality it's creating, which is the CO2 it's creating. And that's at the European market price, right? So that's the price European regulators essentially think carbon should be priced. So this is a gift of 150 billion euros the regulators are essentially giving Total uh, to, to, to keep in running. Uh, and so yeah, it's twice the market cap, so uh, I think it's quite interesting to get. It's just, it's just a simple way to get an idea of, uh, of what these companies bring as value. Okay, and then the, the, the second thing is to think about trees. So we had a, a Deborah in the first presentation, she talked to us about these uh, projects they have about tree offsetting. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of making a link with this and taking this reasoning a bit further and saying, well, what if, what if you all did this, right? Because it's a great idea, right? So, um, and so the thing you can think of is that trees are made 50% of carbon. So it's quite simple. So 50% of the mass of a tree is carbon. So this is also a tree. So this is also carbon. So you can also use this. Uh, and so a tree is roughly, um, roughly one ton for one tree, a large tree. And so if you plant two big trees, you get roughly one ton of carbon that's uh, extracted from the, the atmosphere. But again, you have to keep it planted or you have to replace it with another tree or you have to keep the timber right, for this to be long term. And this is a study that we're using in the paper where we have um, different removal rates. You can see that the removal is usually faster for the first 20 years of the life cycle of a tree and a bit slower for the last uh, 40 years of the life cycle of a tree. And then after 60 years, usually trees don't bring any carbon capture, right? So if you think of the Amazon forest, for example, it's not really capturing carbon, it's just storing carbon, right? Uh, and here you have different uh, climates. Some things that work very well as well are mangroves. So if you manage to restore a mangrove, that's gonna bring you much more carbon capture. But these things are just a bit less commercialized than trees. Um, and so, so what we do, we ask roughly two questions here. We say, um, how much space do we need on our planet to offset all the historical emissions? And then how much uh, space do we need to offset the reserves of fossil fuel companies? So that's something fossil fuel companies are promising their shareholders that they'll burn in the future. That's what the Daniel report say. We have so much reserve, believe us, we're gonna burn it. Uh, that's why we should have a value, right? Um, and so this is sort of our, our headline uh, finding as well. So, um, so these are all gigatons of CO2 and linked to some space, right? So what do we have here? So if you look at all habitable land without forests, why we have forests, because these forests are already captured carbon, so they can't capture more than they already do. Um, or maybe they could, yeah, I mean, fair point. I mean, if you manage them better and so on, that's what we saw today, so maybe some, some room for improvement there. Uh, and so you can see that pretty much if you want to uh, offset all the historical emissions, you'd pretty much need to put uh, trees on 80, so that's 89% of our land on Earth, right? So anywhere where humans can be, so this room, anywhere, you'd have to put tree on 89% of the planet uh, if you want to offset what we've done already as harm in the past, right? So that's quite a lot of space. And then if you're an offset what fossil fuel, so these are only privately listed fossil fuel companies, the only things you can buy on the stock market. They have roughly 673 gigatons of CO2 in their reserves. And if you want to offset that, well, you'd need uh, probably the surface of Russia and uh, Canada together, or United States and China together. So on the whole territory of the US and Canada, you'd have to put, uh, on China, sorry, you'd have to put only trees to offset this. And, um, and if you go back to Total, for example, if we say, well, Total is going to offset its emissions in France, well, you need 22% of the French territory uh, planted with trees. So you'd remove this building, you'd remove everything and put trees everywhere. Uh, and so if you do that for all the countries, you can see which countries are at 100% and are able to offset the fossil fuel from their fossil fuel companies, and which are not. You can see, you can see that uh, Aramco is huge here, and that's uh, Shell in the Netherlands. Um, but, and that's also the, the sort of idea I was giving you. So this is how much space you'd need uh, to offset the reserves of fossil fuel companies. You'd have to put trees on every square inch of these uh, two territories. So you'd have to put them everywhere. And then if you only look in, at space where you can actually plant trees, so in the places where there's no trees at the moment, and you're looking at all the historical emissions, you'd have to, that's my 89%, you'd have to put trees everywhere you can here. So if you have a, an empty space, that's based on some, um, something, it's based on the data that's using GPS, and it's based on a GPS study that looked where there's empty space to put tree. And so if you put tree everywhere with a space, you'd have to put them here uh, to offset uh, historical emissions. And that just gives some sort of perspective. 
Uh, and there's a lot of limitations to this, but I think we all want to go for drinks. So I'll, I'll spare them to you and I'll just give you my beautiful conclusion. So, you know, so there's, there's the idea of capturing, ca capture and storage, but it's way too expensive and you need either a free source of energy or fossil fuels to do it. Well, then you can have a market, that's great, but uh, a market's not going to change anything to the universe, right? You just create a, a parallel market. You could plant trees everywhere, but as I've shown, you know, there's some limits. You have to put them everywhere. We have to remove this building and put some trees here, which is not really what we're trying to do. And then the last thing you could do <laughs> but that's really what you should be doing is reduce emissions. And uh, I think that was it for me. So it seems finally we have the video from uh, Vincenzo. So it's arrived on the last minute, so they overcome the technical problem. So it's just a very short video. And we conclude the session. in the third edition of the SEC workshop on climate and finance. I would like to thank our professors, Sofia Ramos, Jostan Martel, and Francis Leclerc, as well as Marie Miller, who organized this workshop, as well as all the guest speakers who shared their insights and expertise with us this afternoon. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our partners, Amundi Asset Management, AXA Investment Managers Alternatives, FL Investment Group, and Societe General who support the Amundi Asset and Risk Management Chair, as well as the Shaping the Future of Finance Chair. Reaching the net zero is one of the most pressing challenges we face collectively. It urges us to take action at every possible level. Indeed, sustainable value creation cannot come without sustainable production and consumption, which urges us to take action towards creating new economic models and indicators. That is why today's workshop is particularly relevant. Indeed, the financial sector is a major actor in most economic activities, and therefore it can have a positive impact in addressing the biodiversity crisis and make change happen in organizations, businesses, and states. At the SEC, as a business school, we also have a responsibility to act on climate change and more generally on sustainability at our own level. We are committed to taking these issues seriously and exploring all new avenues towards solutions. In keeping up with our strategic pillar together, dedicated to ecological and social transition, we are undergoing a radical transformation by integrating these issues in our research, teaching on our campuses, as well as in the activities of our students, professors, and partners. We need to walk the talk. To give only a few examples, we are working to make the SEC campuses carbon neutral thanks to renovation works, energy efficiency, as well as change of daily habits and eco-practices. We put environmental and social transition at the heart of our governance by creating within our board of overseers a social impact committee that assesses our extra financial performance. We're also training 100% of our students and participants on social and environmental issues, two dimensions that are definitely correlated in what needs to be a just transition. Since September 2020, all the students enrolled in undergraduate and graduate programs have been taking a compulsory 20-hour course on climate change challenges and a 15-hour training course on social responsibility. They also benefit from transformed core courses in management. This way, we make sure that every future SEC graduate has the relevant knowledge to take part in the challenge of sustainable transformation. This workshop has been a great example of the synergies we are building to share expert knowledge, find solutions, <coughs> and act on climate urgency. I hope you feel stimulated and invigorated by it. Thank you for your attention and see you soon. Thank you.